hear the word mafia, what does that make you think about? Probably famous images like Marlon Brando in The Godfather, or perhaps a suited Tony Soprano with a cigar hanging out of his mouth. But if I was to ask you another question, which country do you think of when I say that same word, mafia? There is only one. Italy. The history of the word itself is interesting. In a legal sense, its essential meaning is a family-based hierarchical criminal organization, an unlawful association whose members exploit their communities and where things like the omata or the code of silence is practiced. In Italy, there is also a sociological meaning which has been stretched to mean pretty much anything people don't like. So, for example, environmental crime will be referred to as eco-mafia or illegality in the agriculture sector as agro-mafia. So the word itself is complex. As the Italian immigrants left Italy and headed out into the world, the Italian diaspora took the mafia idea with them and created their own distinct versions in places like the United States and Canada. And it is this version we have all come to know, the Hollywood version, shaped by Americans, not Italians. Today, Italian mafia groups are entrenched in both the legal and illegal economy of the country. You may have heard of some of them, like the Camorra in Campania or the Andrangita in Calabria, and of course, the Cosa Nostra in Sicily. But there are others like the Sacra Corona Unita in Puglia, or the familiar Basiliski from Basilicata, and then the Nigerian Mafia or criminal syndicates from the Western Balkans. So this is what makes Italy such a fascinating case. In the Global Organized Crime Index, the country has very high levels of criminality, but unusually also has very high levels of resilience. And so over the next two podcasts, we're going to be talking about Italy. In this episode, we're going to look at Italy's mafia-style groups and how they've become such an entrenched part of Italian society. With Enna Sergi, Professor of Criminology and Organized Crime at the University of Essex and an expert on Andrangheta. Luca Storti, Associate Professor of Economic Sociology at the University of Turin as well as a visiting research fellow at King's College in London, and Monica Uzai, International Programme Coordinator at Libera, a network of associations that is fighting organized crime and corruption in Italy. Welcome to The Index from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Thin Lewin. In this series, we'll take a deep dive onto the Global Organized Crime Index and take a look some of the biggest organized crime threats facing countries and regions around the world. And so I begin by asking our guests whether it was a surprise that Italy scored 9 out of 10 for mafia-style groups in the OC Index, starting with Ener Sergi. It does not surprise me. I wonder actually why we didn't have 10 out of 10, considering it's an index that is based obviously on uh, on perceptions, open sources and interviews. So I wonder who got the 10 out of 10 (laughs) of presence of mafias. But seriously, it does not surprise me because mafias are overarching in Italy. We call everything mafia. So of course, the pervasiveness of mafia groups, whether or not they are within the actual main ones, the ones that according to Italian law have been part of the, you know, convicted out of a a tribunal sentence and all, whether or not we are talking about those mafias or other type of mafia-like behaviors, it's it's clear to see that in Italy, this is the dominant form, not just of organized crime, but the dominant form of crime uh, most of the time. And it's, uh, so it doesn't not surprise me, no. Monica? Oh, yeah, I completely agree with Anna, of course. I I just have to add that uh, we are pretty aware related to that the phenomenon uh, is quite an adaptive one, so it's uh, pretty changed from the past, and uh, today is stronger than before, if we are thinking related to that, so we are really not surprised. Luca? 
I'm so sorry. I, I have to say that I'm not surprised <laughs> as well. I mean, I'm not surprised because it's a reality. Uh, it's a matter of fact that uh, in Italy, in certain areas uh, of Italy, not everywhere in southern Italy, not everywhere in southern Italy, that's a really relevant point. I mean, organized crime groups and mafia groups are not at all a second skin of southern Italy, as several northern Italians do think. But it's a matter of fact that these kind, this type of organized crime groups are pretty powerful in Italy from one side. From the other side, this, as Anna said, this index is based on perception. And in Italy, there is the perception that mafia groups are pretty strong. Sometimes we might overestimate the power of organized crime groups, the power of mafia. Uh, and in other uh, contexts, in other territorial areas, maybe in other countries, the uh, presence of mafia groups are underestimated. Anna could tell a couple of things about uh, endogenous uh, organized crime groups in the UK, which are pretty similar to mafia groups, but nobody is taking care of, of them. So th this might explain uh, at least uh, partly the difference between uh, uh, the high score that this index is scoring in, in Italy compared to other countries. Thank you. Um, Anna, I'm coming back to you. You mentioned, you know, the three main Italian mafia groups that Europol has identified as well, the Cosa Nostra and Drangita and Camorra, right? Can you tell me a little bit more about them and, you know, what kind of activities they're involved in? I think I already have to correct <laughs> Europol. Um, I mean, I know obviously the, the focus has always been on these three, but uh, there is, well, it depends where are we looking for the label of mafias. If we are looking for the legal label of mafia, then we need to include a very obscure group from Basilicata, the Familia Basiliski, which uh, was considered a mafia group, sentenced as a mafia group in 2010. We have to consider the Apulian uh, mafia groups, uh, specifically both the Sacra Corona Unita, uh, which again was sentenced uh, as a mafia group over 20 years ago now and still today is active. We have to consider the Mafia Foggiana, which is a, a very violent, difficult to handle, very rooted group in the north of Puglia. We have to consider different type of Ndrangheta groups in the north of Italy, so would be fairly autonomous from the Ndrangheta in Calabria today, so they are a very different beast. We have to consider those groups in the north of Italy which weren't considered mafia and now they are. We have to consider what's happening in Rome uh, and whether or not that is that includes mafia. Some groups in the Rome area have been sentenced for mafia type criminal organization. So I guess it's it's very it's already very clear that sticking to the three uh, mafia is is already outdated. Um, I know why Europol is doing that. It's the it's the three mafias where we have focused most of our history in terms of um, even judicial history and research. But at the same time, uh, one thing is mafia organization, another type is mafia type uh, organizations, and mafia type is a very different thing. All mafia groups are involved at some point in their history, not to, not now. In they want to be involved in very lucrative businesses, which do include drugs, different type of drugs. Not everyone is able to enter cocaine. Not everyone is able to to do to do the importation. Some of them will just be managing the distribution, or even the dealing if they are so inclined. Some mafia groups are able to infiltrate legal economy, and Luca will speak about that more clearly at very high level, but some others will really try and fail <laughs> at this stage. Uh, we fortunately have had some success. Um, some mafia groups will try and uh, pervert the democratic process, so um, to embed themselves in local elections, whether it's at the municipality level or the provincial level or the regional and national level, that's a different story, different capacities. So mafia groups are, as I said, um, trying to make money, trying to hide their proceeds uh, in one or the other way, whether it's uh, money laundering in the legal economy or whether it's uh, hiding physically the money in a different country or using and exploiting the banking system of, in the cross-border 
um, difficulty of financial investigations to do so, or uh, eventually just, you know, trying to reinvest in the political sphere. So very, very diversified. I think there are some elements of specialty that we associate to mafias, including, for example, cocaine when it comes to the Ndrangheta, even if obviously they are not the only ones doing cocaine. Um, We are talking about certain groups, so we know about certain groups in, um, in the Camorra, uh, area, the Camorra is a difficult one to explain, uh, but some specific groups, the good ones, let's say, are doing mafia, they are uh, fairly invested in the legal economy when it comes to the environmental green economy. Uh, but again, they are also very much involved in drugs. We are talking about local elections and local democracy when it comes to Cosa Nostra. We are talking about certain specific type of contraband and illicit trade when it comes to the Puglian groups. But then again, it would be just generalization because every group manages. Yeah, there is no really specialties. It really depends on opportunities and context and eventually capacity and agency of these groups. It sounds like they are involved in so many different, you know, and diverse activities, really entrenched. Um, But what about in terms of similarities and differences between these groups? Are there any? Yes, as I said, it's um, they are all mafia type groups for a reason. They all uh, are interested in uh, the control of financial activities, economic activities in their communities of reference. They are um, they they try, they have the so-called will to power, will to power meaning uh, entering and having a say in the democratic process uh, or in the administration, public administration of their own communities, and at the same time they are after money and money that remains untouched. So they are very, very jealous about their money. We probably all are, but obviously depends on how you make it. So of course there are expectations that we have. We do expect mafia groups to do certain things at this stage because we have studied them, we know them, we know what makes a mafia group. Some of these things are obvious, uh, as I said, involving in involvement in criminal activities that are profitable. Uh, some others are less obvious, so they might engage in a new type of, let's say, schemes, uh, whether that includes fraud. Um, for example, um, there was an interesting case related to pharmaceutical fraud uh, in Calabria, and, uh, you know, that's fairly unique, but not because it never happened before, but because, you know, it's a, it was a, just a, something we hadn't seen in a while. So it really, yeah, you, you can expect them to be able to take opportunities more than others and to have the capacity to be immune from scru- scrutiny for at least some time and uh, to be able to ex- exploit societal ties uh, more than others, because that's what it takes to be organized crime in a way. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Luca, can you talk a little bit about how these groups are structured and how they have grown to become so powerful? Well, I, I mean, uh, that's not very interesting and difficult and complex topics, since mafia groups are complex social phenomena. And uh, social phenomena are made up of persistence and change. Mafia groups change over time. And in a certain uh, time, you might find different organizational structures between different mafia groups, given the fact, as Anna said, that they have certain aspects in common, this combination between uh, trying to uh, make money and to um, have a certain... Uh, grip over society. So governing uh, and doing business, this specific combination is uh, a a trait of mafia groups. Uh, Then uh, they have an organization. They are a specific kind of organized kind groups. uh, And these uh, organization can vary, can change over time. They can have a more unique uh, uh, hierarchical structure or they can have a more uh, horizontal uh, and network uh, uh, organization structures. It depends. And within a specific type uh, of uh, mafia, you might have in different period of time, uh, in different years, uh, different kind of organization during the 70s and the 80s, Cosa Nostra, the Sicilian mafia, has tried to build up a pretty hierarchical organization. Things have changed. Nowadays, 
we are likely to find within Cosa Nostra a more horizontal and network organization, which is pretty similar, uh, briefly speaking, to the Camorra, the mafia type, which is rooted in uh, areas close to Naples, well, just, I mean, that region. Maybe, I don't know, it's really difficult to say, Andrangheta uh, is maybe something in between. So neither over-organized nor under-organized, so, uh, so to speak. So again, I mean, we have, uh, basically, the answer would be we have uh, different types of uh, organizational structures that we might find in different uh, types of mafia. And within one type of mafia, things changed over time and we might have phases in which the organization is hierarchical and other phases in other times, other circumstances in which the organization is more horizontal. Thanks for that. Monica, I want to turn to you now because you, I believe you mentioned earlier about uh, the organized crime group's adaptability, how they have successfully adapted to changes in society. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, you know, if you can give any examples of how they have changed the way they conduct their activities. I think that I can start this argument and then I get the floor for my colleagues here. But uh, what we know today and uh, it's pretty linked with our, with our action as civil society groups, is that if in the past the, the violence and the criminal violence was pretty argued with the, the territories, so you got a different scenario in the 60s, in the 70s, and with the deaths and the murder people in our streets at the end of the 80s and the, the beginning of the 90s, today is not that. And uh, Italy is pretty changed as country, and... Uh, is pretty change its cultural and societal landscape. So today is uh, completely different from the past. And uh, we know that the action of the criminal groups are, and mafia types groups is pretty linked with the north of the country. And uh, at the same time, they get brought also for the things that we were saying before. So that's where we think there is the adaptive Part. And one of the instances that we can remember is also the Terra dei Fuochi in Campania. So the, the fire lands where uh, the connection of the legal and illegal system is pretty at the eye of the, of the people. And uh, we are dying for what is linked with the, the traffic of, the, of, of this kind of... It's something that is happening. It's something that uh, is really connected with the economical issues and... Uh, we need to keep our eyes open and uh, read a lot, uh, as Anna was saying before, with their studies. Anna, uh, you're the expert on Andrangita, and, and you were also talking just now a bit about, you know, the, the drugs and the cocaine. Um, and I think for a long time, you know, people have said that they control the whole st- wholesale cocaine market in Europe. Can you tell us a bit about how they got to that position and why? Is cocaine important to them? What role does it play in their activities? So first of all, no one controls the cocaine trafficking in Europe. Uh, not the Ndrangheta, nor anyone. That is uh, one of the hyperbolic comments that uh, some prosecutors made and everyone believed. Uh, but there is no such a thing as, as controlling a whole supply chain, which includes several nodes from production in one country, logistic and trafficking through different continents, and eventually high distribution uh, at the wholesale level and then um distribution at the retail level, so that's not possible. However, some Ndrangheta clans, not all Ndrangheta clans, have managed to reach a level of an oligarchic, let's say, position when it comes to cocaine. This was something that they reached between 2000 and 2010, so that was the decade of the consolidation of the cocaine, let's say, dominion, I wouldn't call it control. And the reason for that was a number of reasons. First, they had money. And there is no way you could traffic cocaine if you don't have, you can import, sorry, cocaine if you don't have money. Uh, more importantly, they managed to establish a system in uh, Latin America, in Latin American production country, whether they would have their own broker, not necessarily a Calabrian broker, but usually an Italian one, often a Calabrian one, 
who would work for different clans you know, and establish some sort of rolling contracts that would eventually secure the shipment of cocaine from certain countries, first Colombia, then Peru, Bolivia, into Europe. A couple of things happen as well, including the establishment of important routes, direct routes from Latin America from tran- for transshipment of you know, various type of goods uh, into the port of Gioia Tauro, which is a port heavily embedded in an Andrangheta, um, let's say, dense area uh, in Calabria. And obviously that facilitated the containerization of cocaine uh, for them. However, they would not be able, they would not have been, and they would still not be able to do so without securing partnership with other networks and other groups and essentially becoming less mafia and more organized crime in the rest of Europe. Today, they are not. Definitely, they they lost some of their control. They have been sharing partnership with different groups. They have been adapting to the rise of the Balkans routes of cocaine. So obviously, they are still prominent players. But eventually, to be successful in cocaine, the Ndrangheta really managed uh, to do so because of, again, money that they could invest and an ability to do something that other groups couldn't do at that time, and now they can uh, in other conditions, which is to import in the same... So to essentially combine the position of the drug importer and the position of the drug financiers. So they were both the ones who financed cocaine and the ones who imported it, which I don't want to go into too much details, but it's not usually how cocaine trafficking works. Usually you have someone who does the importation, someone who pays for the importation, and they might not be the same thing. But at the time, they managed to cut extra layers and extra expenses, and that's why they consolidated their position in the cocaine trade. But as I said, it's a consolidation and it's a prominent position, but there's no way it's a control. Thanks for busting that myth around that control. And, you know, you also talk about how, obviously, they got into this because they were rich in the first place, and that's how you you, you could do it. Could you tell us a bit more about how they become rich? You know, we've seen media reports talking about how, you know, Cosa Nostra's power has been dwindling since the state cracked down after the murder of um, Falcone, but that, you know, Nderanguita's influence has, has grown and that it's now become one of the richest organized crime groups in the world. So the Ndrangheta has become, well, the Ndrangheta clans, some of them, again, some of them are not rich. I keep saying they're really struggling. Uh, it's quite pathetic in a way, actually good to see. But uh, the, the clans of the Ndrangheta, they became very rich. Uh, they did so in two main ways. So some of them uh, grew at the back of Cosa Nostra. One of the most untold parts of the Italian history of mafia is how much Cosa Nostra and Ndrangheta clans were intertwined at the time in which Cosa Nostra was dominating the heroin market towards, especially the, at the time, towards the States uh, and Canada. And so if you think that in the famous Pizza Connection operation, which is the you know the first one of the first ones that people associate with the Italian-American Cosa Nostra in uh, New York slash upstate New York, New York City, upstate New York, we actually had one of the ports of origin of the heroin uh, was Crotone, in Calabria, and that was done with the help of the Rangheta families. Similarly, when um, cocaine, uh, sorry, heroin arrived in Montreal, and it was handled by some Cosa Nostra representative there, it was done so also thanks to the Comiso family in in, uh, in Siderno, who were also active and associated with some Sicilian slash Italians in Canada. So some of them were already embedded in the Cosa Nostra. Let's say under the Cosa Nostra umbrella, and that's how they made their name and their fortune and their guarantee of being uh, reputable criminal actors. Some others, and these are the most, again, the most uh, official story of the Ndrangheta, came rich um, thanks to a series of kidnappings that they carried out. These kidnappings were carried out in the, from the mid-70s to the mid-90s, obviously, with a peak uh, in certain years of the 80s. Some of them were fairly violent, gruesome. Some people died. We are talking about an estimation of over 200 kidnappings from all over Italy brought down to the throat of the Aspromonte region. And this is really about a couple of very strong clan federations from the Aspromonte area who are today considered, still considered the elite of the Ndrangheta. 
and in terms of their recognized prestige in the organization. So kidnapping for ransom was another accumulation of capital that they managed. But then eventually, as we've been saying all along today, mafias are really about exploiting their communities. So taking money away from work that, sh- that was allocated to certain type of activities. We, I mean, there are horror stories in uh, in Italy or in Calabria specifically about uh, the port of Gioia Tauro, about the famous um, motorway of the south. And uh, so all the big injections of money that came legally in, uh, in the way of, you know, trying to develop the infrastructure of Calabria and trying to have a plan for the south and for the, 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 the growth of Calabria, where at different levels hijacked uh, by some people linked or part of Ndrangheta family. So different ways of accumulating capital. I know I've like s- said this almost to the death of it, but it is also fascinating just how entrenched they are and also how, how they've grown to be this big. Anna have been talking about quite a lot of these all sorts of different um, Italian mafia groups in, in the country, but there are also groups from other countries like the Nigerian mafia or the criminal syndicates from the Western Balkans. Are these groups able to establish themselves and challenge the Italian mafia groups who've been around for much longer? You named a particular case related to Nigerian mafias and it's pretty interesting because it's one of the criminal groups that here in Italy gets a recognition because they are pretty similar with our criminal groups for the structures that they, they have and uh, the kind of uh, action that they promote uh, in, uh, in the criminal way. But I think that it's, and dealing with my job directly in uh, with African countries, it's pretty interesting that in Nigeria is pretty different from the case of the Italian case of the relations of these kind of criminal groups that we need to remember that born in a university context and uh, they get the cults, they get a, a lot of pretty different uh, meaningful symbols with their actions. So I totally agree with Luca when he says that uh, we cannot have a, the same layout with every kind of group, but at the same time, we know that the affirmations of the, these kind of groups, also thanks to some reports, as for instance, one of the anti-mafia investigative direction year after year, renew and recognize the, the, the role of this kind of criminal groups in their affirmation in our country. So, and the harmonization at the same time of the forces, the police forces in particular, also with the countries of origin, of the origin countries of this kind of criminal groups is pretty different country by country. So it's something not so simple to understand maybe, but many times thanks to for instance, the, the action also that we have in Europe for the harmonization of Eurojust and Europol, we know that today is pretty different from the past. Mm, thank you. Anna, just very briefly, um, what about Italian ma- mafia groups operating internationally or having international connections? Would you be able to tell us how they interact with other international organization or organized crime groups, for example, in other parts of Europe or places like Colombia? All Italian mafia groups are able to connect based on opportunity. As I said, I did a project on seven different countries in Europe about the presence of Italian mafias in these seven countries, and um, the, the results are always the same. Their business is naturally cross-border, so we're talking about drugs, we're talking about money laundering, which do need to have, they, they can't happen without partnership, they can't happen without connections with local groups, which doesn't mean that the local groups enter into the mafia, they just, you know, they're just networks, they're just professional, let's say, links, that mainly when our mafias act abroad, but their core remain in Italy, what we see is essentially just drugs and money and some other cross-border type of crime, but that's majorly drugs and money. So obviously they have to obey the rules of the market, meaning whether it's cocaine or it's cannabis, whatever it is, um, there are um, you know economic rules of the market, so they can't just uh, close up to, to themselves. 
so that is uh, very much i think the the again the the problem we still have uh, is uh, that we assume that our mafia groups when they are abroad they are somewhat better than other um which i don't think they are i mean i've been looking at different groups uh, european based groups who are um, more harmful more violent uh, in a way even more um how can i put it widespread in terms of the reach um so it it's always a matter of labels and it's a very good what monica was saying in terms of learning how similar certain phenomena are in their own context and eventually just you know learning uh, what works where in terms of different uh, capacities that uh, communities and law enforcement can have yeah it it sounds like you know it's almost like a parallel almost like a parallel universe right it's almost like us as well it's just that the, the networking and all of the business connections is, is organized crime and underground. I want to talk about COVID-19 pandemic because Italy was the first country in Europe to be hit really hard by it. Um, and Luca, did you notice if the pandemic and all the lockdowns, you know, because of the pandemic, did that affect the mafia's activities or were they able to actually exploit the situation? And if so, how did they adapt? Well, that's another in, uh, intriguing question. Uh, I think we do need more uh, empirical investigation to give a proper answer. Broadly speaking, I mean, generally speaking, whenever a sort of shocking event uh, occurs, mafia groups might try to take an advantage or to adapt themselves to the uh, new uh, situation. This could have happened during the first stages of the pandemic. For instance, uh, and unfortunately, in, in several areas in Italy and uh, all over the world, basically, several uh, workers have been uh, laid off uh, by companies since they were uh, redundant. And whenever the unemployment rate increases, Mafia groups can try to take an advantage and to try to get involved these people in the organization to offer them something, some sort of small jobs or some way to, to, to survive. And this is a possibility, just a possibility. We, we don't know that, but we might look at this kind of correlation between uh, several negative outcomes of the pandemic and the reaction of mafia groups. From one side. From the other side, uh, mafiosi are basically normal people. Uh, they can take advantage from COVID-19, uh, but COVID-19 uh, has been problematic for them as well. I mean, they can get infected, first of all. They had less chances to, to do their business as several entrepreneurs uh, uh, had during the uh, worst phases of the pandemic. Uh, they had less chance to, to move as no other people had. So, I mean, we have both sides. Again, when a shocking event occurs, the structure of opportunity uh, might change and new opportunities can be uh, beneficial or even negative uh, for uh, uh, mafia groups. So we have to look at into uh, more deeply and in a way, I think we have to avoid thinking that the pandemic has necessarily been uh, for mafia groups uh, uh, a great opportunity. It, it has been an opportunity, but also a, a problematic issue for them as well. Yeah, thanks for yeah bringing that other other side of it that I think sometimes we don't we don't see. Question, brief question for all three of you is: I want to I want to hear from you. You know because you're Italian, but also you have been working on this issue for so long now. Has public opinion of mafia changed over the years? Um, if so, how and when? I mean, and, and, and you know, perhaps did, did that start with the assassination of Giovanni Falcone or before or after? Um, Anna, can I start with you? So um, I think perception of mafias is something that probably Monica can speak more about because that's really what Libera does uh, to, to, you know, to, to shape civil society from within. Surely the Giovanni Falcone, Paolo Borsellino, and the people with them who died uh, in such an, uh, an obviously um, 
terroristic manner uh, shook consciences, but I think it, it shook also consciences outside of Italy. So I think it's uh, the resonance of that has been mostly also outside. It did give birth um, shortly after to movements, including Libera, as Monica will probably tell you, but let's say the changes that we've seen in the past years have to do with uh, re- an understanding and a study and a kind of resilience in in different ways from the advocacy part, from uh, the judicial part, of course, so the potential that Giovanni Falcone saw in the anti-mafia specialist unit, which were very much his idea and were created out of his uh, planning uh, is very much what we live off, uh, the idea that we have anti-mafia prosecutors and we are, you know, we've been among the first in the world to do so, uh, is definitely part of why we have such prominent uh, mafia, anti-mafia trials, um, and at the same time, why we have such prominent mafias, because there is no mafia that does not have an anti-mafia and vice versa. So the, definitely Italy has done marvelously in certain ways. I mean, uh, the concept uh, of mafia is not what it used to be. It's a lot more complex in Italy than many people perceive. One of the things I found in my research in uh, in Europe, especially the Europe one, but also abroad, but specifically outside of Europe, also um, in, in Europe among law enforcement, is that law enforcement thinks that Italy thinks of mafia in a very different way than it actually does. When you speak to any mafia, let's say mafia expert in Italy, not just us, and not just Libera, um, different people, we all have a very nuanced perception of what it is and how it acts. And, um, you know, the shenanigans of movies and the um, reduction of complexity is, is really a thing of the past. Not a very, very long past. I mean, I, uh, I moved to the north of Italy, to Bologna in 2005 for my degree in law. And my colleagues in Bologna had no idea what the Ndrangheta was in 2005. And now they do, <laughs> because they also went through, you know, a very profound change in their own region. So um, it's not that long ago that, you know, there was a, still a, a lot to discover and a lot to understand. But I think we made amazing progress in terms of understanding and knowledge. It's probably that it's not that clear to see outside. That's lovely. Public opinions of mafia, how has it changed over the years? Um, Monica, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah, starting from what Anna was saying related to the role of Giovanni Falcone, because she's right, Libera gets need to recognize that uh, we born for... Uh, the living memory of the innocent victims of mafias in the beginning of the 90s. In the 1995, born the Libra Networks, thanks to the reaction of the people against the criminal violence. So and then above all, the, the murder of the judges, in particular Falcone and Borsellino, but not just them. So it's pretty important for us to uh, highlight this this role and where we start our action, the memory of Giovanni Falcone fully embodies also what we mean by making a living memory on a way, so parts that make his figure uh, as a direct testimony that we take in hand uh, uh, to never come back to see this kind of criminal violence that plagued our country, and in particular in uh, between the, the, the late 80s and uh, the early 90s. And um, within also the the role of the pool anti-mafia, the role of the other judges, the role of their investigations. Uh, one of the most important ones is called Follow the Money, and uh, it deserved the statue in the gardens of the FBI agency in New York for this investigation. So it's an important legacy that we need to protect with our work. It's uh, uh, important for us to remember also the other more than a thousand names of innocent victims uh, every year on the 21st of March for the National Day of remem- Remembering and uh, and Commitment for the Innocent Victims of Mafias. And uh, it's something that uh, for the public opinion that you were asking to me now, reconnect uh, so and know, so to be against this kind of uh, phenomenon with uh, an alternative, a concrete alternative that we propose. And what we propose is to be to regenerate our territories, to regenerate our economies, markets, and uh, and lives, uh, thanks to this kind of life in memory for a different future. So I think it's the synthetic of what we are trying to do. 
Mm. And you know, uh, on the resilience episode, because we're 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 having more than one episode on the Italian, you know, organized crime phenomenon, we are going to be focusing quite a lot on that institutional framework and all the changes and 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 all the uh, the new the new laws. But I want to stay a little bit more on the criminality side. I, I want to continue uh, on this issue and talk about public procurement and the mafia infiltration there. Luke, can you explain a bit more on how the mafia has captured this aspect and, 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 and where they fit in even within the legal economy? Well, j- just a few words that can give you an idea about these aspects. I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately, mafia groups and mafiosis are really able to deliver uh, services that can be useful for businessmen, protection services. They act as a broker. They are really able in building social networks and so on. So to speak, mafia actors are really able in establishing win-win games. We uh, refer to win-win games when we have specific kind of interaction and exchanges in which all the people taking part to this exchange might take uh, an advantage. And so mafia actors are really able in gain something, but in let other people gain something as well. And this is actually the reason why they can infiltrate the legal economy, since they might be helpful for uh, entrepreneurs, for businessmen. They might infiltrate legal and formal politics since they might be helpful for politicians and they might might infiltrate uh, public administration since they might be helpful for civil servants and so on. Helpful at least in the short run. In the long run, they have super negative effects also for the people that got in touch with them. But in the short term, people that cooperate with mafiosi can gain something and has John Minor Keynes said, in the long run, we are all die, all that. And so we don't think of, of the long-term consequences really often. We think of the short-term consequences. And in the short term, in the short run, get the cooperation with mafia actors might be tragically useful for a minority. Uh, it's absolutely negative for the majority of the population, but the minority of the population can take some advantage. And so basically, the ultimate answer to your question would be they can infiltrate the legal economy and politics since they have something to offer, which is basically protection, uh, which is they facilitate doing business, they keep contacts between actors and so on. And these are very, very uh, effective resources uh, and uh, components that they they can bring in the business world, unfortunately. Mm, So essentially, you know, local and national businesses also have, you know, relationships with the mafia, perhaps not of their own choice, but because, like you said, because of protection or they're able to deliver some services that perhaps the public administration cannot, that they have to deal with the mafia. Yeah, in a, in, in a certain way, yes. Then it depends. It's really interesting to look at the investigation. Sometimes mafia actors try to get in touch with the entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurs feel to be forced to cooperate with them. But we have to say that in several other circumstances, our businessmen that look for mafia actors and try to get the cooperation uh, uh, from mafia actors. So entrepreneurs were in a way free to decide. I mean, all of us is not absolutely free. We have always have opportunity and constraints. But there are several businessmen that were started to search for mafia actors. And so they decided to get in touch with them to have a practical and economical advantage. So we have both situations. Sometimes entrepreneurs are forced to cooperation, to cooperate, sorry. Sometimes entrepreneurs uh, search actively for the cooperation. And unfortunately, we have found out several type of these cases, even in Northern Italy, even in cases of pretty rich entrepreneurs that might have had difficulties, 
difficulties and in order to face up to these difficulties they decided to get in touch with mafia actors believing that this could have been a good way to survive the difficulties and again in the short run it was from a practical point of view a good choice in the long run they started to have a lot of problems with mafia actors and basically they ran out the business and they failed out of the of, of the market but in the short run they had some sort of competitive advantages towards the other entrepreneurs but they freely decided to get in touch with mafiosi um, last question what does the future hold for the italian mafia um mafia or mafia type groups are they just going to be a permanent fixture of italian life and society monica do you want to go first we would really like that uh, our, it's a phenomenon that uh, needs an end so we need to end up this kind of criminal action with our commitment with our with the role of the civil society and uh, the social organizations in general, but not just them, also thanks to the repression, thanks to the holistic approach that we have. We know that what we said before, really, in particular, I'm, I'm convinced that it's a human process, also the criminal one. So we cannot stop the, the human process, but we can stop maybe the violence and the criminal action of this kind of process. So we need to foster and to promote uh, our action because we are better this kind, than this kind of uh, of criminal action and uh, it's something really connected also with the convenience of the people to be without this kind of violence so we are stressing out day by day these kind of things and uh, in any case we know that it's not something linked to tomorrow but uh, we need a lot of time because as we know, and as we say uh, always, we got the most ancient mafias in the world. And at the same time, we got also the most ancient anti-mafia groups in the world. Great. Luca? Let me say, I am from Northern Italy, from Milan, actually. And several Northern Italians have uh, several stereotypes about Southern Italy. Still, really often we in Northern Italy, we still have the, the idea that uh, mafias are a sort of native soil of uh, southern Italy. They re just reflect the culture uh, of southern Italy, which are super uh, naive interpretation uh, uh, of mafia, uh, which are racist in character. Of course, mafia groups exploit cultural codes. Of course, mafia groups are rooted in, so in the society in several areas of southern Italy, not everywhere in southern Italy. But they are not a native soil of southern Italy. They are a social, historical uh, phenomenon, and they might disappear in the future. Why right not? That's a possibility. It might happen. Then, uh, if you ask me as a, a social scientist about change, uh, really often we look at process of change as they were sort of replacement. We have pre-modernity, and then we started to have modernity, and now we are in a post-modern phase, which is a kind of, let me say, a superficial way of thinking of uh, social change. Uh, social change is uh, more often a, a matter of rearrangements. All the aspects might reconfigurate uh, within uh, a new assets. So this might happen to mafia uh, groups as well. They are going to change for sure in a way. They might find a new way to adapt to society, to economy, uh, to the new society and to the new economy situation we are going to have in the, in the future. Uh, we don't know how, but we have to keep our eyes open to how they are going to change and if and how they are going to, to survive. But for sure, it's an open-ended process. It's an open-ended path. Uh, there is no reason why they should be always there. Thank you for listening to the third episode of The Index and to Anna, Luca and Monica for joining us today. If you want to read the country profile for Italy, it's available in the podcast notes, where you can also find a link to the Global Organized Crime Index. 
the index lists 193 countries around the world and scores their levels of criminality and resilience. It's a fascinating resource and can be accessed by anyone. Just head over to ocindex.net. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with our Italy Part 2, where the focus will be on resilience and what law enforcement and civil society are doing to combat organized crime in Italy. That's it for this episode of The Index from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Dele Thanks for listening.